Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. I trust you guys are doing well, doing wonderful, doing epic things. And ain't that true? We all want to just break free. Happy weekend. For everyone that's here, this is Rich Ladies. We're going to get started because uh, I am only a co-pilot to this conversation for all things that are Rich Ladies. And I'm joined by the one and the only uh, Katie Shea in the house. Let me just come on up there and unmute her just to hear her voice and have her say hello and good morning. Well, that was a, there we go. There we go. We got it. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to see everybody on the call. I'm excited. It's a Saturday morning. We're all sitting here which says a lot about all of us. So I'm just really excited to have everybody on the call this morning and excited to see, you know, where this conversation goes. Here's, here's what I like. I like that we're sitting here and not, not laying down here because sometimes that's not a good sign either, right? But uh, great to see uh, so many old friends and good people. First and foremost, what's up? Terrence Lushington in the house. Good to see you, my friend. I do notice you. What's up, Lauren? It's good to have Dimitri Priviet. What's up, Panit? It's good to have Cindy, Daniela. I hope you're feeling well. It's good to have the Sundar family in the house, always representing. What's up, Adele, Jay, Robbie? What's up, big guy? It's good to have Marlene. We have California. We have Ireland, Scotland. Of course, Katie Shea, you bring the wind from the Windy City. It's good to have Brianna. It's good to have Mr. Hebert, Mr. Phil. It's good to see Bill, Bob, Jack, and Jimmy. What's up, guys? Oh, look at you, Marlene, with your fancy new jacket. Check that out. I got jacket envy. So that being said, I'm, I'm going to get started because uh, these sessions on Saturdays are coaching sessions that we are just getting started back up. For those who know and have been around sort of the Rich You community, we've done these calls for now a couple of years. And during the pandemic, it was kind of like, let's hunker down and find a way to survive yet another week in quarantines and such. And uh, we created a number of interesting coaching platforms. We began to coach people on sales and leadership, what it took to have a courageous conversation, uh, we began to develop people in their relationship with money, wealth, and worth. But there was one particular conversation that began to, well, bubble up. And it was a conversation that we've come to call rich ladies. And, and when it came to rich ladies, we, we want to make sure that you all understand by definition what, what that distinction even means. Because for me, as a coach and as, a, as an author and as a speaker, uh, I, I, I grow people richer in the things that matter. So it's not a money conversation, it's a meaning conversation. It's, it's not like I gotta have more bling to be meaningful, or I have to need, I gotta fly around in a helicopter to feel like I've achieved something. It's not about stuff, it's about significance. And I think significance is the new sexy. I think significance, making an impact on others while making an impact for yourself is what life's all about. So a rich lady, uh, as I refer to some of my notes, is really defined as someone, and Katie, I think you'd agree, it's defined as someone that identifies as a woman and as a lady truly is a living expression of self-acceptance, who feels truly expressed, who is unhindered, and is really looking to live life growing richer in the things that matter for themselves and for others. You all get that? Just give me a thumbs up. So a rich lady really is an expression. You got that, Joni? Sandra? Miss Lombardi, Miss Lewandowski. I mean, it's an expression because some days you wake up and you don't feel like it. Some days we wake up and we're overwhelmed. Some days we wake up and we're like, we can't wait for it to be Friday or another day or someday. But, but that's just what it means to be human. So we are always looking for what's the best expression that resonates and moves with you. Like what moves you? So... With that being said, getting richer in the things that matter, it's it, it, it growing richer is, is counterintuitive. And I'm going to get into that today because we have a lecture topic that I'm going to ask Katie what it's all about, and she'll explain why it exists. But, but, but being richer is counterintuitive. It's, it's not in the DNA of a woman to have it all from my research. It's in a woman's DNA to do it all. And understanding that distinction, I say that with a lot of respect, and that's why I have, I'm a co-pilot here. I'm not, because I'm clearly not, uh, I don't identify as a woman or a lady, but I stand for all people living richer in the things that matter. And that's why Katie's co-piloting this with me. But, but for women to grow richer in the things that matter, it's counterintuitive. 
Because if you want to make note of this, and especially if you're a coach or a speaker or a trainer, you might want to know this. I'm all about distinctions and definitions, right? Is that a woman is built to provide, to protect, to preserve and persevere. Better than us guys. I'm just saying it straight, fellas. I know we got a few men in the room, like my man, Jay. What's up, birthday boy? I see you, Vincent. It's your birthday all month, man. I keep calling out your birthday. It's like, that ship has sailed, but I keep, I keep, I know I keep threatening to wish you a happy birthday in some new fashion, but it's going to come, buddy. But, but to provide, to protect, to preserve and persevere, that's in a woman's DNA. So a rich lady embraces what's in their DNA, but to grow richer in what matters for themselves and for others. It's not selfless, but it should not necessarily come at a cost of over self. Y'all get that? Just give me an okay. So Katie, is this on point given that, you know, you're a coach, you're a trainer, you're a speaker, you work closely with me and the Rich You team. Uh, I know that you coach and mentor a lot of women in the world of sales and leadership, largely uh, helping them do uh, network marketing, peer-to-peer -peer marketing, building their own business, you know, getting on their side hustle, and you predominantly work with women. What's your sense on, on what it takes to be a rich lady? Yeah. So for, to be a rich lady, I think that that's great. Thanks for you. But like for, for me and for me talking and speaking to a lot of women, a lot of women, what I've noticed is that, you know, we all want to go do all these big things and we all have these great instincts about us, but we always get stopped and we always get stalled. Right. And Sandra's like, yeah, I know exactly what that is. Right. But we always get stopped and we always get stalled. And you know, when it, when for me, especially it's that self-doubt, right? That self-doubt of, can I actually do this? Can I go out there and can I, can I actually take my instincts and actually drive it forward to go towards a life that I really want? And so that is something that I've noticed in myself and women that I talk to. And I think that, you know, we have all these great instincts, but we always get stopped at it. So Katie, tell me though, give me an example of where you are clear that you have like self-doubt running you, self-doubt keeping you, self-doubt getting you stuck or stalled as yeah. you just called it. So give me an example. Okay. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I have like, I, I'll call it out. I have, I have imposter syndrome and I know that. So I, I go and I sit at this table with all these really successful people and I'm super outgoing and I'm super one-sided and super confident. And then the other side of me just pulls back and I become the observer. And when that happens, it's really me just kind of going back to safe because I'm so scared of, of living out the, the, the real me or being judged or being, you know, quote unquote, found out that I haven't made it yet. Right. And so right there, my self-doubt comes in and it takes over me. And then I kind of just sit back. And so that right there, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just... I became the observer and I didn't step into my full power of that confident woman that I know that I am. Mm. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. And, uh, and I got to tell you that at the end of the day, um, I have an insight for you, but I'm going to hold on to it for a minute. Don't let me forget. I'm going to give you an insight and I want everyone to witness that it's an insight that she doesn't know I'm going to give her, but I'm going to give it to her because of what she just described. Because what a purpose of a coach, and if you're writing down any notes and if you are uh, inspired to be a coach, or a mentor or a trainer, like someone who's a real catalyst for change, an agent for transformation, as I like to call it, right? You always are listening for what's between one who's sitting in point A and point B. So where, what's in between that? What's in their way? Because the act of being a coach, whether you're raising money or building an MLM business or whether you're selling products or whether you're providing services, all someone should be doing is empowering people to get to the other side. That's all it is. It's just taking a step, going from point A to point B, and doing so without having to really irreversibly transform the things that are in their way. Because let's be real. If you have a fear of losing money, it'll be hard for you to invest. And even though you might do a great sales job and people might reluctantly invest, that fear is not gone. It just doesn't govern the, 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 the decision to act in that moment or to, in fact, buy a property or to, in fact, start a business or, in fact, to invite someone to a dinner or a networking event. Whatever people fear owns them. 
but there are brief moments where they can see the other side of that because it's been said that everything you want is on the other side of everything that you fear. So self-doubt is not a fear. It's an experience. And if you're writing down any notes, I would start here. So what Katie describes is, is what starts to overwhelm her, what becomes her, the conclusion she draws. She called it self-doubt. Well, it just so happens that I now self-doubt myself. Now, remember, self-doubt by definition, doubt is, and here it comes, according to Oxford Dictionary, is to call into question. What's up, Stephanie? Go get it, girl. It's to call into question. It's to call into question the truth. So that's a very charged definition. That's a definition. So when I'm doubting anything, and by the way, for, for all the mothers and fathers in the room, or people who are uncles and, and tias, you ever notice that your nephews or your nieces or your children, when they're about to do something for the very first time, but they're not quite sure how it's going to turn out, what do they all do? They what? What do you observe them doing? Let me see in the chat room. And if you're not driving, you can type in there. What do you notice them doing? You can see them. Well, what would you say, Katie? What, would you, what have you observed young people doing when they're in doubt? Um, when, with young people, when they're in doubt, they, they just, they, they get like their, their physiology gets like very, like, like just crunched down and, and small. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's just like a huge change in physiology. Got it. Very good. Now, Sandra uh, Vrankovic got it. I hope I said her name right. Um, a lot of people are saying they go for it. They're fearless. They just do it. That's only after encouragement. You can do it, little fella. You got it, darling. You can get it. You'll be safe. You'll be fine. Because what we do is we reassure, right? We, we remove all reason for doubting out of the consideration. So what you notice is what we witness is hesitation or what I'd like to call trepidation. And trepidation, by definition, is a feeling of fear that causes hesitation. I don't know. I'm not sure. Stay awake, Lauren. It's going to get better. I mean, I, I don't know if I want it. I, I don't know how it's going to go. Because what we're absolutely allergic to, what we absolutely resist as human beings, is uncertainty. The only two things that govern us to do something or not is do things that are certain and avoid things that are uncertain. And if we take on anything that's uncertain, we need to know the risk. I need to, I need to know what's at risk, what's it going to cost, how long will this take. And I'm just saying by definition and observation, it's often witnessed by us fellas that women will ask a lot more of those questions than us men. That's why we've been observed as being risk takers and women have often been considered risk averse. But you want to know why? because you take it on for everyone. Men are very selfish. We'll take it on for ourselves. And our value of ourselves versus the value of our goals is quite disproportionate. Ah, screw it, I'll do it anyways. We'll deal with the consequences later. While woman, female, or lady, however you identify yourself, you'll say, hold on a second, Slick. That's my house you're talking about. That's our line of credit we're on. Those credit cards are owned by both of us. That cash is ours. Slow down, cowboy. So all of a sudden, you can see the disequilibrium, yeah? So, so when you witness doubt in action, and I would write that down, especially if you're a mastery student here, when you see doubt in action, that's trepidation. That's hesitance. That's where Katie's language makes sense. That's where we get stuck, we get stalled, or we're stopped. So self-doubt, if it's an experience, where do you think the experience begins, Katie? If you had to start unpacking this for our friends here, where do you think, where does it start? Um, so self-doubt, so correct me if I'm wrong, but from, from my experiences, I think it starts from, from the past and the conclusions that you've created for yourself subconsciously. Very good. Because the only place your confidence in yourself lives is in having experience having done something confidently. That's why practice makes perfect. So when you keep doing the same thing over and over again, especially something that you're really, really, in fact, very reluctant to do because you're not sure how it's going to go, you're able to do it again. A lot of my real estate investors on this call, your first property was the toughest. 
Second one, not as tough. Third one, well, got easier. Your 10th one, it's a breeze. Then you become someone like Jay, who's doing deals in his sleep or in between bottle services. You know, Monica, to relocate to an entirely different country, right, was a real tough thing for you. Monica Guerrero there, you'll see her in the beautiful turquoise right now in Costa Rica. I mean, now having done it, it's going to be easier if I said you want to go to Peru. And you're like, done, because you've gone through the exercise. You, you've already dealt with it. and You've survived to live and tell about it another day. Y'all get that? Give me an okay. So what you've got to know is that is that self-doubt, I want you to write this down, is, is when you feel incapable. That's what self-doubt is. It's when you feel incapable or you carry a distrust. You carry a distrust in yourself about doing a certain thing. Now, the reason why you don't distrust yourself or feel incapable brushing your teeth is because you do it likely once, and if you're good, twice, and if you're really good, three times a day. It's the repetition of doing the very thing you need to do. What ends up being abandoned and absolved is any doubt about doing it. Same with driving. First time you drove, pretty tough to do. But every time you did it, we call that practice. I would rather replace practice with the word repetition. The more reps you put in, the more airtime it's given, the more hours you log in doing that thing that you're scared of doing, the more capable you'll become. So, so for anybody, what you've got to know is that Katie's right. There's something that's happened in the past that actually likely stops you from trusting yourself to do something new. So when you experience anything about self-doubt, if you experience any self-doubt at all, you've got to know that that experience you're having today was based on an experience you had likely around the ages of five to eight. According to real great psychologists and child behavioral researchers. So when you really think that between the ages of five to eight, maybe nine or 10, if you were a late bloomer, like Keith UT, if you're a late bloomer, what would have happened was something went down, you were made fun of, you may have been laughed at, you may have had a horrifying experience, you tried something new, it didn't work out, you fell, you crashed, you got it wrong, you came in last, whatever it might be, and you said, never again will I try something new, let alone the thing you just did, but something new. Like, so what do you think about that, Katie? Okay, so that's, okay, so five to eight, that, that makes sense. So I'm thinking back to like my own self, and I think that this will relate with a lot of people, but so growing up, and Richie, you know this, and some of the girls on here that have been in calls with me know this, but I grew up with like a learning disability, or else that was what I was labeled as. So I was put in all these small classrooms, but from five to eight, I didn't know that. And so I, I that, that came to be like when I was like sixth grade, that happened when I was put in all those small classes. But before that, I was, you know, in all these classes and my teachers would just, God, they, they were so mean to me. I had a teacher literally come up to me because I wasn't raising my hand or answering the question correctly. And she flipped my desk in front of the whole entire class. And then she sent me in the hall and said, never be like that. And that moment stuck with me. And so I think that that moment back then has really come with me subconsciously through everything that I do in my life right now. Of course it does. And I want everyone to write this down because this is a gift from Katie, Shea, and I talking here. By the way, are you guys enjoying this right now? Put some love in the chat room. Give me a thumbs up. This was Katie's idea to bring it back and to do it great. So we're so grateful for her being a real global champion for all things rich. So grateful for you, Katie. Um, always bringing it. But, but here's what you want to write down. Is, is your future is always based on the template of your past. So if you ever want to get a sense of what's going to happen, how you'll respond, how you'll act, what you'll do, how you'll behave, just look to the past to see how you've already demonstrated that. And again, the way in which our minds are built, it perfected only one act over 3 million years. And that's one act, survive, self-preservation, not to be motivated, not to be lit, not to speak sexy like Terrence Lushington, not to look great like Marlene Quaraz. I mean, not, not to drive and do three things at the same time like Sama Mohammed. 
Keep it safe, girl. I mean, I mean, it's only built to do one thing, and that's really seek things that are certain. So whenever you see that, this is all really about the function of, write this down, especially if you're a coach or a mastery student, self-governance. Self-governance. You all have a governing mechanism. And by the time we're done here today, I'm going to share with you a way to hack that system. So this is not just going to be a real great talk with, with, with Richie D and Katie Shea. I mean, this is not just a conversation. We want to make sure it's an elevation for you, a transformation even for Cindy and Stephanie, for Danielle Tucci. So when you look at self-governance, what self-doubt does is it's a cautionary alarm. So for Katie, when she goes back to that experience, by the way, I'm not going to perform psychotherapy or transformational work here, but here's what you want. You want to keep it simple, right, guys? Is that when you look back at her experience, what does her mind has, what, 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 it's already made itself up that any time she steps outside of the experience she had back then, she's, she can envision a table being turned. You all get that? You get that, right, Katie? Yeah. So what you want to do, step one, and I would write this down as a thing to do, and I would even do it right now if you can afford the time to do it, like Tara Flynn can and Lauren and Sandra and Dimitri and Joni. You want to write down where you feel incapable. Like the things that really, truly intimidate you. This is for everybody, including my good friend, Don Rossum. What's up, buddy? I mean, you want to be able to write down where you feel incapable. Every area of your life, just name the things. Maybe even something you've been putting off because you feel incapable. What you want to do is you want to write those areas down because that's where distrust breeds. And it's not distrusting in the thing you need to do. It's in the you doing the thing you need to do. Because as your mind is searching for proof and evidence that you can too, it only has what to reference as a benchmark of doing so. The what? The past. So what you want to make sure you understand is that this is a cycle that can be broke. So I want you to write this down because it's important that when it comes to self-doubt, self-doubt is really a function of how you value yourself, my friends. Whenever you have it, whenever you experience, and and, and by the way, it can be sneaky. I I see some real high achievers on this call. You know who I'm talking about? Like uh, Vincent, Keith, Jay, especially, Christian. What's up, Mike Gumnani? Especially you. Is that, is that if self-doubt is a function of how you value yourself, you're always looking for how you're making an impact. So when that scoreboard's low, doubt sets in. See, you're insignificant. See, you ain't up to anything. See, you're not doing much. So stay still. Stay small. Stay insignificant. Now, if you're a woman, if you identify yourself as a lady, that's even worse. Because then we bury ourselves in all the other things we need to do, and that's why you do it all everything that there is to do and although those things are important they're not for you they're for everyone that includes you but last but last if at all and i mean if you follow anybody here in particular katie shea i know daniela lombardi talks a lot about self-value self-worth right girl i mean that's a really big conversation and then we see all the other areas of your life that suffer as a result of that so when you look at that really self-doubt is your way of holding an evaluation of yourself to do the thing in the future you intend to do. So if you're writing down notes, it's an evaluation. The minute you said self-doubt, I doubt, I'm hesitant, or I have a trepidation, you've assessed it. You've already made up your mind. And 99.9% of the time, your mind is telling you, stay still, stay small, sexy. Still and small is the new sexy. Grow, let's go. And that's not good. That's not consistent with who you are, what your dreams, your aspirations, or your ambitions are. And then you start to blame things like him, like them, like the kids, like the context, the boss, the opportunity, the market. Katie, is this resonating with you? Yeah, no, it really is. Um, I wanted to ask you something like on, on the other side of things, which this is exactly what you're saying, but those conclusions and everything that really shapes, you know, who you are, would you, 
would you say it's more of like people actually believe it? Like we actually believe that that's really who we are. Like if, if, if past experiences have shaped and, and we brought it into the future, like, do you think people actually really truly believe that they don't deserve it or, or those different belief systems that come up? Katie, you're spot on. Guys, if you're writing down any notes, this is a good one. You ready for it? You will believe. I would write this down. You will believe. You will believe everything you tell yourself. <laughs> now, in the old research days, we'd call that self-talk, right? Self-talk. Inner talk, inner voice. Some of my good friends like uh, Dr. Bob Proctor, you know, um, a lot of friends like Tony Robbins. We talk about a little bit of the, the inner talk, the inner voice. And what that is, is that it's, it's your way of processing through a conversation without outer dialogue. But what I would go so far to say is that whatever you're saying up here, people witness out there. Whatever you're having a conversation about up here, people are experiencing it out there. So when you really start to understand that self-doubt, when you say you doubt yourself, when you have trepidation, when you're hesitant, you've got to know that you've already performed an evaluation. You've already conducted an assessment. And it's all based, and here it comes, it's all based on your sense of the outcome. So if it's not going to go the way you want it to, if it's not going to go the way you believe it should, if it's not going to go according to the plan you've got, you've got doubt. And doubt fuels fear, fear fuels hesitation, hesitation, then is seen and then is concluded as self-doubt. Well, I'm not going to do that again. Well, I'm not good enough. So here's some of the words you got to watch out for as experiences in your life so not to succumb to self-doubt. Number one, hesitation. Number two, not knowing. Like as, a, like as a conversational construct. Well, I don't know. You know who says that a lot, by the way? Kids. Kids say that a lot. You want to know why? Because their minds are lazy. They Google too much. The metaverse is cool, but reality is where we live. So uh, I don't know. So when you say, I don't know, it's because you don't want to figure it out. Well, hold on. I don't know. Let me figure this out. I just recently got driven to an airport and, 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 and the driver says, you know, I've been relying on this, this, this device, Waze. He goes, I grew up as a taxi driver for 10 years in this business until Uber came in and demolished the taxi business. He goes, now I'm so dumb in my own city. I need this device to drive around. I used to be able to know exactly where I'm going. I said, brother, you know exactly what you're doing, but you know what you now no longer have a real intimate relationship with? is your intuition. That's what we really lose. But I digress. So hesitation, unknowing, and the last one is uncertainty. So uncertainty and unknowing are a little bit different. Unknowing is I just don't know over here. Uncertainty is evaluation of what's out over there. So if I get up from my desk right now and open up the front door, I hear some noise outside. I don't know what's outside. That's an uncertainty. But I'm certain enough to open the door to find out. Y'all get that analogy so you can see the distinction difference? Okay, great. So here's where the shift's got to go as we move along in this lecture. And we want to hear from a few of you, maybe that you might have some self-doubts that Katie and I would love to hear about, is you want to transcend self-doubt and you want to get to self-do. Drop the out. It's a bit of a phonic maneuver here when you spell it all out self-doubt drop the out and do self-do the number one way of abandoning a self-doubting assessment of yourself is to do something one thing a small thing anything but inside the construct of what it is you doubt here's an example and katie tell me if this is dialing in right for you if you're a rich lady and you are saying to yourself, I really would love to start my own side hustle. I want to have my own business. I want to start a coaching business. I want to start speaking. I want to run an MLM business. I want to go out there and network market, whatever it might be, right? But I don't know if I'll be successful. I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I have all the time. I don't know if I'm going to be able to be good, good at this. I don't want to hear from him. I don't want to hear from them. I don't want to fail. I don't want to get it wrong. All those things, right? Is this tracking right, Katie? Okay, great. Yeah. What you do is one small thing. What you do is you first want to now just schedule when you'll get it done by. 
this one thing, one positive step towards the grand vision you've got for yourself. You want to build a business? Start reading about what it takes to start one. Because what happens when we doubt is we are overwhelmed. Who's ever felt so nervous about doing something that it started with a nervous idea, then all of a sudden you started getting the nerves, all of a sudden you had the butterflies, then your heart started palpitating, then you began to sweat, and then you started to fidget, and then all of excel. Who's who's with me? Who's tracking with me? I, there's some situations in my life. You get what I'm saying? That's the amplification of your mind saying, uh, don't do it. Uh, don't do it. Uh, hey, girl, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And all of a sudden, it just, and then, and then, and then you don't. Right? You've got to live life like you're on the end of a bungee cord. Jumping always and knowing you'll come back. You've got to. Because if you don't, then you'll always succumb to those functions of your physiology that's all based on your psychology, which is based in a past, which quite frankly, if you're writing any notes, your future is written by a five-year-old. And when you realize that, you're like, oh, shit. How can I at 30, 40, 50, I don't think there's anyone over 50 here. Nope, all, all under 50. We all look pretty damn good, Jay and Terrence and... We look good. I mean, that's what happens. And now we're in these conversations with people where we're, we feel lit up for at least an hour because we're, like, we're around people who really actually see life the same way we want to. You got what I'm saying, Joni? So, so to, to, to transcend self-doubt and go to self-do, here's the four things you'd want to do. And these are, just, these are just quick actionables, but I haven't gotten to the hack yet. The first thing is you want to define what you have doubts about. You should always carry an inventory of the, of the stuff that you're resisting, the things that you're doubtful about, the things that you're hesitating with, the things you don't know, the things that feels uncertain for you. Keep them on your radar. Number two is you want to zero in on one. You want to zero in on one. If you feel like you're being like ganged up on by a gang of bandits, you get out of there by punching one at a time. You can't swing at them all. Number three is you want to take a small step with that one. But here's the most important one. And it's the last one is you want to celebrate the win. And it's not esoteric, right, Katie? It's not like, it's, it's not like, oh, well, he said I can drink when I actually succeed. So, you know, here's to me. It's, it's not being cute. It's actually a chemistry thing. That when you actually acknowledge and say, guys, this is to a great week. I did something that I was really afraid of doing and I did it anyway. So this is for me. There's a release of both serotonin and, 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 and dopamine in such a way that your brain is now being rewired chemically to say, huh, look at that. We did it. This is to us. And so there you toast. It's an act. It's a trigger. So for me to be a performance coach for just 30 seconds, a trigger is a positive anchoring method that when you hold up a glass of champagne or Prosecco or bubbly cider, I mean, when you pull out the champagne glasses, which by the way, I almost guarantee that in your house, unless you're Russian, is the dustiest glasses in your home. Because Russians drink champagne every day. Привет, right, Dimitri? You know I'm right, buddy. And the Ukraine too, of course. But champagne glasses are the dustiest ones. And you want to know why? It's because we celebrate very little when they should be the most used. They should be the most used in your house. And I almost bet, I almost bet there's some people here that don't even own champagne glasses. What's that tell you? That celebrations only happens when you head to a wedding, go to bar mitzvahs, especially if it's something that's run by Karmit Noam. You all get what I'm saying? Katie, is this tracking? Yeah, yeah, I know it is. But, um, you know, I'm thinking back, like, I, like, this conversation makes me think back to a lot of moments in my life to where, like, I've had a lot of self doubt, and how I've gotten past that. And these steps are exactly what I did, but I didn't consciously do these steps. Like when I first started out in roofing sales, and I was driving to these companies and getting rejected constantly and door slammed in my face. Like I, I sat there and I would just drive to roofing companies because I was so scared to actually approach them that I would drive to it, say, I'm going to do it. I would pull up and then I would just drive right away because I was terrified. 
of, of that rejection, that self-doubt. And so um, back then I just made the decision to get really good and immerse myself into sales. And that's why I went in that direction. But it was really to take that, that small step to actually find out, okay, how do I get really good at sales? And I started researching, I started doing things and I started role-playing and I started just like immersing myself into that world. So it's, it makes so much sense that all of these steps, this is the exact order of what you need to do to kind of counteract that. That's right. That's right. You're, you're absolutely right. And a lot of us as parents, we've done that too, right? You stuck with your, with your child or your nephew or your niece or your godchild and teaching them to be in the presence of whatever it is that they fear, they doubt or have concerns with, to grow their comfort in discomfort. That's the key. But as we get older, we have more at risk. And so our relationship to what it means to risk amplifies. There's things today that I would never dare do given what's on the line compared to when I was in my 20s, which is only about a 10 years ago or so. But those things I did in my 20s, I wouldn't dare do today. And once in a while, when I do them, I'm like, wow, that was really risky, given what's at risk, given what I have to do, given who's counting on me, given all the things in which I'm involved in. You all get what I'm saying? But for you, and this is a breakthrough for you, Katie, I hope you hear it because it's going to open up the next big thing I want to tell you shortly. And I want everyone to write this down because it's a realization that rich ladies have made is that self-doubt really is a door. Self-doubt is a door that you allow to rise that keeps who you really are hidden from public view. It's a self-preservation mechanism. It's no different from if you're about to do something and you're nervous. What's the first thing that happens for you? that tells you you know you're nervous. Come on, who are you? Are you the sweaty palms kind of person? Are, are, are you the getting hot kind of person? Are you the twitching with your ear or the hair kind of person, Lauren, I see you. Are you the butterflies? Are you the eye avoider? Hope they don't pick me. You know, you know what becomes you to remind you of the physiology you need to become to put doubt in place so that people don't see your greatness. Because the ultimate thing that we should actually understand is that when self-doubt is ridden, what you really fear, and this is coming back to a conversation we had, Katie, is being afraid of being found out and always having to be counted on for that greatness. Adults aren't afraid to play because they're afraid to lose. As we get older, we're afraid to play because we're afraid to win and then be counted on to win always. We don't want to be counted on. We don't. Or else we'd all be up to something. You know, just recently, I just returned from New York City, an amazing city, meeting with friends and family, partners and associates. And uh, I have a dear friend. His name is Kwaku Mandela. He is Nelson Mandela's grandson. He is the chair of the House of Mandela. And I went to an evening event ran by an organization he's involved in called Global Citizen. Now, for those who don't know me, Katie, or the rich universe, I mean, we do a lot of cool stuff. But when I was in the presence of Global Citizen, who just, in fact, raised a bunch of money brought massive awareness to climate change, brought massive attention to the need for vaccinations in third world countries, and who brought massive attention to ending poverty in parts of the world that is really struggling to really make ends meet. I thought to myself in that moment, in this room, I was the smallest, least impactful human being I knew. Now that either scares you or that rattles you. And that rattled me. I said, how do I get to do more? How can I get involved? How can I play a part? I want in. Y'all get what I'm trying to say? So what I'm saying is that we often will play the game. We're most comfortable in because we know we'll win. And that game, though, remains always so small. It's like playing tennis with a five-year-old. Because really, you are. Every single day of your life, you're playing tennis with a five-year-old, and you're winning it every single day. 
Katie, is this, uh, before I get to the hack, Yeah. does that resonate with you? Because I was kind of talking to you a little bit. I mean, for you, you know, getting, getting labeled with a learning disability was adults, an adult's way of labeling you with something that then parked it rather than really empowering you with it. Yeah. And, and now that you realize it wasn't actually a disability, it was a, dis, it was a dysfunctionality that required more coaching, more care, more, more, more consolation, more cultivation. And now all of a sudden it's become one of your strengths. Yeah. I, I, I use it as a superpower. And the one thing that you told me, which I thought was really kind of cool was if you know something like that to go and speak about it, right? Cause that's when you really own it. And so you know, me going out there and, and speaking about it and talking about it, it really puts me in that empowering spot to take control and then to go out and, and knock myself out in, in the butt. I was going to say a, a swear word. Oh, there's a kid. That's good. I love it. So guys, she just, you gave me the segue. And, and, and uh, as we were closing off this call and making sure that people get off to their Saturdays and, and practices, some people might go back to sleep, start breakfast, lunch. Uh, we wanted to say thank you, by the way, for being here on a Saturday. We hope this has been of a, a great value for the rich ladies in the room, a conversation that's sensitive to and aware for what challenges anybody that identifies themselves as a woman, as a lady, um, as a female in the world, doing all things for everyone, but nothing for themselves um, as they want to be someone. So we just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, we also know, uh, before I, I get back to that segue, Next Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is a very, very special coaching call. In fact, it's going to be my first. Having been a coach for nearly 30 years in my life, um, having been built by Tony Robbins for seven, having worked with four U.S. presidents, having won three U.S. NBA championship rings, I got to tell you, it's going to be the greatest moment for me because for me, I'll be running for the very first time rich teens. And Rich Teens is going to be a courageous conversation for young people to relocate themselves and their purpose at a young age. And, and what makes it even more unique is that I'm going to be coaching alongside my son, who's 15 years of age, who's, who's right in the middle of that category of 13 to 19-year-olds, where, yes, I'm paying him to be there. We, we've struck a commercial agreement before I go to you, Danielle Tucci. You can hold your thought. Uh, yes, He's feeling a little embarrassed by the possibility of being on air with me because we've never done anything together on air. But, but I want to make sure that I share a little bit of my life in a different way with those who are looking for uh, some direction in life for their kids. And uh, it's exciting. It's exciting for me. So I would say for all women here and men included, bring your kids, bring your nephews or your nieces or your children. And here's why. Three things will happen. One, they can see what a community looks like, a digital one at that. I mean, we've got people here from Canada, the U.S. We've got people here from uh, right across Europe. We've got people here from the U.K., Scotland, Ireland. Uh, we have two people here from Dubai. I mean, we have people from all around the world. This is what a community looks like. Number two, this is what elevation looks like by conversation. Because there's one thing about kids is they've got to embrace the power of speaking. And not like public speaking, but speaking, speaking their mind, sharing their heart their desires, their, their, their souls, their, their fears, their upsets. They got to know that conversation is a way of living, fully expressed with nothing unsaid. And then third is how they can get some direction, how they can understand what they're meant to do, where they're meant to go from an earlier age so they don't have to struggle at a later time when there's more at stake, when the clock is ticking. Or when mom and dad is really saying, you got to get out of the house, you're 41 years of age. <laughs> Maybe 41 is a bit stretching it, but I want to capture everybody in there. Um, so I really love to see you guys next Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Rich Teens. I know Katie will be here with me. Danielle, you want to say something or did you have a question? Let me come in there. Let me unmute you because I saw your hand go up. There we go. There you go. Okay. I just had a question. This is so awesome, Katie. I too had a disability. I have cerebral palsy, but it was caused from birth. So like I, I was only a pound and nine ounces dropped down to a pound too. So I'm doing mentoring and I'm a former teacher counselor as well as a mother. But like with that comes kids with disabilities. I've worked with them and stuff. Other people that maybe minimize their successes. So for me, it was my 
mom that minimized, oh, well, you can't do this. You can't do that. You'll get hurt. So moving forward, being able to do the things that I was told, oh, you can't walk. You can't talk. You're not going to be able to have a kid. I've done that. All that surpassing plus doing more. This is so awesome. And I can't wait to be mentoring and I'll be on this call as well. Oh, love it. Love your, I love your energy. I love your voice. It's good to have you. And I, I just love it. I love the spirit. Um, but there is a fourth and I'll tell you right now is, is, and I, I can see this for people like, uh, Suzanne Zaleski. I see this for Danielle Lombardi and Christian, uh, Vane, Marlene for sure. Isabella and, uh, Vincent Sundar, Carmeet Nawam. I mean, Mike Gumnani even, I mean, there's people here who are parents and who do things as couples and, when my son gets included in my coaching calls or my development calls, I want him to know that it's always okay to see that life's a work in progress, that it's not carved in stone and it could be a collaborative process. So I, I want him to know that learning is growing and growing is living. And I want him to see that. So it's just exposure, folks. It's expanding their horizon for what children, your kids, whether they're related to you or not, get exposed to. Because uh, if, it's, if there's anything that is needed in education, it's elevation. Elevation is missing in education. Education has become this thing we have to do, not this thing we get to do. And I think if we restore the spirit of what education's purpose is, it's to set the foundational principles so that human beings can optimally perform in future generations to come. We're getting dumber and slower and more dependent on technology, not smarter, not more intuitive, not brighter, not faster by our own means. We're getting faster because thanks to technology. Thanks to, thanks to improvements and in, in innovation and disruption. So we want to restore human performance, and it starts with the youth. So uh, I really sure hope to see you guys next Saturday at 10 a.m. Now, listen, I promised a hack, Katie. Let's give these guys a hack. we got 12 minutes left to give you guys the five steps to hacking self-doubt. So when self-doubt enters your world, when self-doubt is an experience, you've got when you're confronted powerfully by being stuck, stalled, or stopped in anything you do, there's five things you can do, five things you can do quite easily, quite quickly, and over time, as you develop yourself and your relationship to those things, um, I mean, you've got to know that you'll be getting to shift and grow that muscle to doing that. And Terrence, I appreciate the love, man. I missed you. I don't know why we're not talking more often. Uh, you don't age a damn day. You must be bathing in, in virgin olive oil every night and, and, and using oil of Olay or something, man, because you look, you look damn good, buddy. It's really good to see you. Let's hook up, all right? So that being said, five, guys. Now, number one, to Katie's point earlier on, you want to build awareness. Write the word down, awareness. And awareness could be as simple as just talking about it. That's the most amazing part about these calls. That's why I'm the most excited about rich women, rich ladies, rich teens, rich Amer I mean, I'm excited because they're just conversations. And as soon as you start speaking about what you fear, what you doubt, what you're concerned with, they begin to evaporate. Because as soon as you put attention on something, that something becomes nothing. As soon as you start putting attention on something, it becomes nothing. So when you speak it, you own it. If you don't speak it, it owns you. Another reason why rich teens is so important. Tell me what troubles you. Tell me what's haunting you. Tell me what's going on in your mind. Speak it. Find a word. Look for it. I'll give you help. Take your time. As soon as they voice it, it begins to evaporate. And I know Danielle Tucci, given your track record in this space, I'm sure you, you agree and understand. But if you were to elevate the awareness, you can also keep a journal. Right? And a journal doesn't have to be fancy. And a lot of people think that a journal is something like your memoir. That, well, what if someone reads it one day and it doesn't read well? Well, that's not what I mean. We're not writing a memoir. A journal is a mental dump. It's where you park thoughts, fears, concerns, joys, or the experiences of life in a particular time. It, it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to read well. You're not going for your Nobel laureate prize. This is where whatever you dump out there, check this out, folks, no longer has to haunt you up here. So building awareness is a muscle. Building that awareness, and it's either a conversation, it could be through journaling, but that awareness is there. You see something that enters your space, your way, your place, you want to disempower it if it doesn't empower you by speaking about it or writing it out. 
awareness. Now, once you're awareness, then you can go to the second half, which is to acknowledge. And acknowledgement's a powerful thing because acknowledgement really becomes the pathway to eventually acceptance, which will come soon, but not yet. Acknowledgement and acceptance are different. I can acknowledge that I have, let's say, uh, people that come into my world late. So I can acknowledge it. Doesn't mean I accept it. I see you. I got you. Acknowledgement is just the declaration of knowing. That's all it is. So that way there's no unknowing. It's the number one reason why people break up because there's shit we don't talk about. It's not acknowledged. I'm an asshole. Well, I'm bitchy. Well, I said I would do this and I didn't. Well, I said I would do it and I didn't either. Great. So we acknowledge that. Now what? By cleaning the slate? Now, a great way to acknowledge, your, uh, acknowledge things in your life that can actually power and fuel self-doubt are things like hiring a coach, being a part of a mentorship group. Like that's why this call for rich ladies happens every month. Katie and I will lead this every month. It's a great backstop to just clear the way. Y'all get that? Just give me an okay. If you want to jump in at any time, by all means, Katie, you can interrupt me, okay? Yeah. Now, once, once, once you have awareness, now it's like, okay, now I'm seeing things. I'm seeing things differently. I'm writing things down. I'm speaking about it always. I'm acknowledging, hey, I see you. I see you doubt. I see you fear. Oh, I see you. I see you. I, I, you're seeing it. Then you atone. That's the third step. The act of atonement is an act of completion. That's where peace lives. That's where reconciliation lives. And by the way, not reconciliation like with, with the natives or in other people. I'm talking about within. This is about you. This ain't about nobody else but you. There's no politics or policies here or, or problems. We're talking about you. How do you live richer in the things that matter, especially you ladies? So atonement is about getting complete. Call someone, write a letter, send a card, have a cup of coffee, go up for a drink. Not six, Jay. But you want to be, I'm just being funny with him. But you want to be able to do a tone. You want to get people flat. You want to be flat with people where there's nothing there. It's still. Because that then powers the fifth step, which is acceptance. Acceptance only comes when you're at peace. Acceptance will only come when you're at peace and you're able to acknowledge. Acceptance only comes when you're at peace, you accept, you acknowledge, and you're aware always of whatever else can come. Acceptance often has come too early ever been in a position where you accept something but you're still angry therefore you're not atoned or you accept something but you're not really aware of how often or where it comes from i got friends in the western part of canada right now i my, my prayers go out to them in abbotsford bc a levee broke a hundred meter breach uh, my dear friends like, like, like Don and Patrick, I, I'm thinking about my RAIN members out that way, my dear old friends. And I think to myself, gosh, you know, uh, the first question I have is where's the breach, right? While people are talking about what to save and what to rescue, get to the breach, get to the source. That's what awareness does, gets you to the source of the breach of why you're doubting yourself. So when you're accepting things, you're not accepting things because you've become nullified to the fact, well, I guess I'll never get to be successful. I guess it was never in my cards to ever have more than enough. My mother was always the hardest working, so it makes sense that I am too. Or I, I have parents that never had enough, and I guess I don't either, so I guess it's just meant to be. No, that's bullshit. Your life's meant to go the way you want it to go, the way you meant it to go, the way you intended to go. What's preventing that from happening is all the things you say in between you thinking it and getting there. That's it. That's all it is. So acceptance is a very powerful gift you give yourself and others. So that then the fifth step is you align. You're able to find a new alignment, a new alignment to being able to commit, to create a goal, and so to go. It's where clarity is restored. It's where conviction is reset. It's where confidence is recalibrated. It's where you are re-inspired because you're completely in alignment. I've met a lot of people in a lot of agreement, but not alignment. They're in relationships, but don't really want to be. 
They're in businesses, but don't want to be there. They're employed by an asshole, but remain there. I mean, we all are in agreement, but we're not always in alignment. So alignment's the truest form to tell you, are you truly in alignment? Are you moving right and feeling light? And I would write those two last phraseologies down. Are you moving right and feeling light? Because if it's not right and not light, then there's something wrong. You're dragging dead bodies with you. <laughs> You're carrying the trash to the curb 3,000 miles from here. And that ain't no life to live. It's been often said it's not the weight in life we carry that kills us. It's the way we carry it that does. So travel right, travel light. All right, Katie, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I know we have like a couple more minutes left, but I think the biggest part for me with going through all this and, and just having a coach this past year, you as my coach, um, I, I've built this muscle of going through these steps, but the big one is that, that awareness and how you said it's a muscle being built and having that complete awareness to when you're, when you have that self-doubt experience come up. And so it, it's a constant practice. And so for me, it's, it's always just creating that, that massive awareness. So then you could go through all these different steps. So then you could come to alignment and fully commit to where you want to go. Mm. That's amazing. You know, uh, great, great to be with you, by the way, today. So great that you brought this conversation about self-doubt. Thank you for all the work that you do and the coaching you provide mm -hmm. women around the world. Uh, good value today, guys. Big thumbs up. Yes. Uh, we're grateful for that. That's all. That's why we do it. We're grateful for you today. I mean, uh, for those who are rich, you subscribers, all of these lectures are available. The recordings are the workshops, the workbooks, all at rich you. Um, so if you're a member, by all means, they'll be logged in there this weekend. If you're not a rich you member, you can go into the chat room. There's a link in there. I know Ken will put in there right now. You can just click on there. It's a, it's a subscription service. It's 99 bucks a month. And uh, we do four coaching calls a month. There's new courseware every month. And uh, I can tell you right now that the, the people I coach in the world, whether it's uh, Google, Bronze Studios, whether it's an NBA team or my mastery students, I ain't cheap. So to get access to me at 99 bucks a month uh, is a great investment you can make. That's as strong of a sales pitch I'll ever make. Next Saturday is Rich Teens. And I really want to make it my goal to have everyone here be back and bring a child. Bring someone and say, look, you matter. The future is depending on you. I'd love for you to be a part of a conversation. No pressure. You won't have to speak, but I want you to see that you're not alone and other kids want to elevate too. So I call upon you all. I, I, I implore you to push yourself and do that. We're not going to sell anything there. We're not going to pitch anything there. We're just going to inspire there. And I think that's fair. Make sense? Okay, great. In closing, there's an old quote that was shared with me by a woman who I felt was one of the most powerful women I'd ever met. And her name was Margaret Thatcher. She was a former prime minister of United Kingdom. And she said that for most women of today's age, believe that light is out there somewhere, when in fact they are the brightest thing burning for all mankind to see and do as they must, men included. So we want you all to know that the light in which that illuminates this world would not burn so bright had it not been for the courageousness of women. Folks, own your power. Step into your own light and know that us fellas are counting on you to do so. It's a real pleasure to be with you guys on a Saturday morning. Ladies, thank you so much. I miss all of you. Cindy, Tara, Suzanne, Marlene, of course. Terrence, Jay, and Jay Dahan. It's good to have everyone here. Linda, big thanks to the Legacy team. And of course, uh, Big Ken and you, Katie Shea, the wind mm -hmm. in Chicago. We're grateful for you, girl. Keep championing all the things that we're doing because we're with you, okay? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Bye. Be great. Be you. Be rich in the things that matter most. <laughs>